This video will be about the disease vestibular neuritis or neuritis vestibularis. We will go through the most essential stuff that you have to know about this disease. We will start off with what happens and the structures that are involved. So you have probably seen a similar picture to this one before. Here we can see the outer ear, the middle ear and the inner ear. But the only important thing in this case is the inner ear, so we'll just look at that part. So with the inner ear, we also have a few different main structures. We have the cochlea, the part of the inner ear that is involved in hearing, the vestibular labyrinth, the auditory nerve, and the vestibular nerve. But the vestibular nerve is what gets affected, so we have to look here to know what happens. We are actually not 100% sure of the cause, but the most prominent theory is that after a previous infection of herpes simplex 1, the viruses will spread around the body and some viruses will end up in a dormant stage, kind of just sleeping inside the vestibular ganglia. But at some point, these dormant viruses will be reactivated and when they are reactivated, they will start to multiply and spread more out along the nerve. These viruses are now active and this active state, the body will induce an immune response leading to inflammation of the nerve. This inflammation causes dysfunction of the nerve temporarily. But how will this actually look like in practice? How will the symptoms look like? Well, if you know that the vestibular or the balanced nerve, if you will, is inflamed and therefore dysfunctional, the symptoms will make total sense. The patient will present with dizziness, also with a feeling that everything is spinning around you and that you might fall over. This is what's known as vertigo. Since the inflammation occurs very suddenly, the vertigo will also occur very suddenly. The patient will get nauseated, nauseated enough so that they often can end up throwing up. If we go back to looking at this drawing again, notice that the vestibular but not the auditory nerve is affected. And since the auditory nerve is not affected, there will be no auditory symptoms. This means that there will be no new symptoms like hearing loss or tinnitus. Tinnitus is when you hear a ringing noise that's not actually there or anything else that has to do with hearing. And if the patient has dizziness and also presents with auditory symptoms that has come very suddenly, vestibular neuritis is unlikely. Now the diagnosis actually rests on two basic parameters. The first is that we have the symptoms that hints towards the disease. And the second is that when, after we have these symptoms, we have to perform an examination called the HINTS examination. HINTS is an abbreviation that stands for three different tests. The head impulse test, nystagmus, and test of skew. These three are done and evaluated together, and the results are important to differentiate whether we have a peripheral cause or a central cause. It will take too much time now to go through each individual test, but you can click on the test that you feel you need to see or find the link in the description for more details about each individual test. But when you do perform the tests, you will get some results and these results should first of all put your mind towards whether we have a peripheral or a central based problem. A peripheral based problem like vestibular neuritis is not an emergency but on the other hand, if you have a central based etiology, it can be due to, for instance, a stroke or a brain tumor, and this should prompt acute further diagnostics and treatment. For a peripheral cause, you should see that the patient can't maintain his or her gaze during the head impulse test. There is often nystagmus, and nystagmus goes from side to side and is unidirectional. And during this test of skew, there should not be any pathology. On the other hand, if we have a central cause, the patient can maintain his or her gaze during the head impulse test, so there is no pathology in the head impulse test. If there is nystagmus, it doesn't go unidirectional or side to side, but on the other hand, it can be vertical or rotational, and it can also be directional changing. And lastly, you can see skew deviation on the test of skew. As a good bonus, the caloric test can be performed to increase your suspicion. There's also a link for that one in the description if you want to know more about that one. Dick's whole bike is a specific test for BPPV and it can be done for differential diagnosis. 
So to conclude the diagnosis, if the patient has acute onset vertigo, is nauseous, possibly throwing up, has no symptoms related to hearing, and the results of the infant exam suggest a peripheral cause, then we can diagnose the disease. Now, before we start to discuss the treatment, there are a few different important points that I got to mention. And these are that treatment can vary substantially between countries. So the treatments that we will go through now might not actually be correct in your case, depending on where you live. But the main strategy is usually to target the symptom and to lower the intensity of the symptom. And this is only done in the acute phase of the disease. Long-term treatment is generally not recommended and also generally not needed. So we mainly want to target these three different symptomatologies, the vertigo, the nausea, and the throwing up. One great drug that affects all of these symptomatologies are antihistamines, for instance, cyclicine, although there are many other types, a great way to start. You can also uh, use antiemetics like ondansetron or metoclopramide to target the nausea and the throwing up specifically. In the end, the main point of the treatment is to make the symptoms bearable. There is another treatment that we need to mention, but this is usually only given by ENT specialists. As you hopefully remember, the root to all the symptoms is the inflammation of the vestibular nerve. And a general treatment that works awesomely to reduce inflammation is steroids. And therefore, steroids can be used to treat this disease as well. Steroids, like prenicillin, for instance, will affect the area of interest, reduce the immune response, and leading to inflammation subsiding. Notice that inflammation disappears, but the viruses themselves are not targeted by the steroids. They will be killed over time until they're in a small dormant population again. Thank you for watching. I hope that it has been educational. If you have any questions, feel free to post them below. Cheers.